Hi. So, like the intro said, I'm here to talk about SenseBridge and uh, hackers, cyborgs, and transhumanists. And uh, for those who don't know, because I'm sure you're thinking about this, what's a transhumanist? Um, basically, it's the fusion of humanists, which was a movement from the Enlightenment talking about our humanity, what it means to be human and our better selves. And trans is kind of the idea of going beyond. And the way it's commonly taken these days is to take technology, which is this force that's transforming our world, and use it to transform not only our world, but also ourselves. That's transhumanism. And the thing that I'm passionate about is taking electronics and building devices that you wear that augment you. And that's what the North High is. And the way I accomplished it was the maker culture. These, you know, group of people worldwide who are working in hacker spaces, maker spaces, and other laboratory spaces to do really interesting things as hobbyists. So, this story really begins with the Wired magazine in 2007. It was called Mixed Feelings. And it talked about a device called the Feelspace Magnetic Belt made at the University of Onsbruck in Germany and the experiences of a man wearing it for six weeks. And what the device is, is it's a belt with a bunch of little vibrating motors. Each one of these green things you see here is a little vibrating motor, kind of like the ones that make your cell phone buzz. And when you strap it around your waist, you get um, a bunch of signals. One of those motors will be on. The motor on the north side of the belt is on. So it doesn't matter which way you face, one of the motors is on. If you're facing north, the motor on the front of you will be on. If you then rotate, the motor over here is on, and so on. And the idea is that it presents a persistent stimulus. So no matter which way you're facing, you have a stimulus that's being presented to your brain that you're aware of that's telling you which direction north is from you. And the thing that really caught my attention in this Wired article was the claims of the guy who wore it. He basically claimed that after six weeks of wearing it, he didn't feel the vibrations on his waist anymore. Instead, he had an intuitive sense of direction. He just knew which way he was going. Furthermore, it, it got even more elaborate than that. After several weeks of wearing it, he claimed he got kind of like a homing instinct, like a pigeon. And he would always be able to point which way was home and which way was the office. He had, you know, maps were building themselves in his head and he, got, he developed this whole new level of spatial perception. And I read that and I was super excited. I was like, shut up and take my money. And <laughs> <laughs> but as with many things in Wired Magazine, they don't sell it. Um, in this case, it wasn't that it was a bunch of hype, which is typical of Wired Magazine. Instead, this was a university project. It was some people in a think tank. And if you wanted to wear it, you could go become one of their grad students and spend four years of your life studying it and writing white papers, uh, which I admit I was kind of tempted by. But I decided instead that I would try to build it myself. And unfortunately, when I read the article, I didn't really have the capability. I did not know how to get started. I did some research and I bought some parts. I found a compass chip that I thought would work and I bought that. And then it kind of sat on my shelf because I didn't really know how to proceed. I didn't have the skills that I needed. So it was sitting all lonesome on my shelf. And then, second part of the journey, I discovered this book called Natural Born Cyborgs by Andy Clark. And he kind of lays out the philosophy or the um, neuroscience understanding of how the device could be capable of the kinds of things the Wired Magazine article claimed. So he talks about how when you present the brain with a persistent stimulus, something that is always there, how the brain over time will adapt. You will stop feeling whatever stimulus it is and start to just have a sense of what that thing is about. And the book gives all kinds of examples, but the, the, most, the coolest example for me was a guy who built a third arm for himself. It was an entire mechanical arm, like an appendage that comes out over here. And then he built a control system consisting of a series of um, levers and knobs between his legs. And he learned over time how to control these levers so that he could move the third arm just like he moved his other regular arms. And in fact, he got so good that he could sign his own signature with the third arm. And then with further practice, and this really blows my mind, he was able to sign his signature with all three hands at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Thus proving that you can adapt to almost anything you can think of. And uh, the reason it's called natural born cyborgs is Andy Clark's philosophy is that the human brain is inherently good at this. When people say that we are tool using creatures, what that means really is that we integrate tools into the way that we use our own body. So your fork becomes an extension of your hand when you're eating a meal. And the car becomes an extension of your feet when you're driving. 
and so on and so on, and we are natural at this. It just comes to us. We do not have to think about it. You just practice a few times, and suddenly you're riding the bike. And it kind of makes you think about what are the limits of human. If you can adapt over time to any device that you can create and use, what can you become? So another big motivation for me at this time, this 2007, 2008, I had the original iPhone. And I had an experience that is now quite common. When you leave the phone behind, you forget it for the day, for whatever reason, you have this feeling that you've left part of yourself. This, this thing that you're used to being able to pull out of your pocket to you know, look at the map or text your friend or whatever it is you're going to do. And when you don't have it, there's this hole in your world. And you feel really odd. Like I said, you feel like you've missed a part of yourself. And I wanted to know, for the feel space belt, what happened after? the Wired article. When he stopped wearing his belt, what happened to his sense of direction? Did he feel a lack in his world? What was that like? And that was one of the real reasons that I wanted to build the device. Which brings us to hackerspaces. <clears throat> I discovered the Noisebridge hackerspace in San Francisco where I was living at the time. And it's a group of people who come together in community to learn how to do things with electronics and technology. And this is a shot of Circuit Hacking Monday at Noisebridge, where Mitch Altman teaches beginners, people who have never done soldering before, how to put together a kit of electronic parts. And mostly they assemble small things that blink patterns or have sensors. Or uh, his favorite project is called the TV Beyond. It's a remote control with only one button. It turns off televisions in public places. And <laughs> <laughs> he, he actually uses it in sports bars, which astounds me. Uh, <laughs> So he teaches people how to solder, and I took his workshop, and I met people. And then I was on the mailing list, and uh, Adam Scorey, who was be to become a friend of mine, but I did not know at that time, sent a message to the mailing list saying, hey, I'm really interested in this field space belt and other cyborg things, and I'm going to be at Noisebridge on Wednesday at 8 PM, and I'm going to talk about it. And I showed up, as did about a dozen other people, and we had the first meeting of what eventually became SenseBridge. Um, we agreed to meet every Sunday afternoon, and we called it um, Sunday Cyborg Mass. <laughs> because, you know, well, what else are you going to call it if you're going to meet every Sunday? <laughs> and uh, Scory and I fell together with a couple other people with the idea to build a field space belt. It turns out I was not the only person with parts sitting on my shelf. There were actually four of us at that first meeting. And with Noisebridge and all the tools at hand there, we had the skills and the tools and the motivation to do this project. And I learned a lot. Uh, one of the first things I learned was this. Lots of people are already familiar with this. This is uh, the Arduino microcontroller project. It is a microcontroller platform for artists. It was originally made in Italy by some um, art professors and design professors with the idea that they wanted to help their students be able to do interactive art installations and other similar pieces that incorporated modern technology without having to teach their students everything you need to go know to get a degree in electrical engineering. They wanted their students to be able to pick it up in an afternoon. And it was revolutionary and is revolutionary. They sell over a million of them a year. And in fact, we have a distributor here in Toronto, Creatron, that sells about 5% of all the Arduinos worldwide. He, he goes through an enormous number of them. Uh, it has the funny name, Duolumanove. I probably don't pronounce it right, because it's Italian. <laughs> And this is a running theme. This is another thing that I had to learn. It's a program that helps you design circuit boards. It's called Eagle, and it's made by Germans. And it shows. Uh, <laughs> I now teach workshops in it, because there's actually only about a half a dozen real tricks you need to know. And one of them is, if you want to make wires, like, like you see here, you're routing a signal from one place to another. If you want to make wires, there's a command called wire, which you don't use, because that makes lines. Instead, you use a command called route, because that makes wires. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a great program, provided um, free of use for non-commercial use, which is amazing. But the third thing I had to learn how to use was a sewing machine. And I was using it on all kinds of strange things, because the North Pole was an unusual project right from the start. We were doing it on you know, stretchery, stretchy, rubbery things, uh, felt, Velcro, uh, nylon meshes, all kinds of weird materials that sewing machines are not particularly friendly with. And it was a real learning curve for me. I can't tell you how many sewing machine needles I broke at $5 a pop. Uh, I think actually the sewing machine was more expensive for me than the electronics. 
And, and I have to say, I learned to, how to solder at the same time, roughly. Uh, on the level of difficulty, soldering irons are like down here, and sewing machines are like massively up there. <clears throat> or maybe I just had poor teachers, I don't know. <clears throat> um, but we did succeed, finally, in building them, one. And not just one, we actually built many different versions. Uh, early versions look kind of like this one. You can see that's the nylon mesh that I was talking about. And the idea was, in these little pockets here, we would insert the motors at regular spacing, and then the electronics gets held with an elastic along the front, and it turns on the motors just like the uh, fuel space belt. And this design had a fatal flaw, which we maybe should have predicted. I don't know. I, I didn't see it coming. But basically, the, the motors would vibrate against the nylon mesh, against your skin. And it turns out that the nylon mesh is kind of hard and rigid, and vibrating it against your skin causes blisters. Yeah, so I, I spare you, I do not actually, I took a photo of it, it's very ugly, you will not actually see that photo, I've spared you. Um, but yeah, we, we quickly wised up and we started using other materials like felt and eventually uh, four-way stretch velvet, because we're classy. <laughs> <laughs> and those are much more comfortable. And um, I did get the experience I wanted. I wore a North Paw anklet around for several months and learned really interesting things about my sense of direction. Uh, the most important thing that I learned was um, outdoors, I actually have a reasonable sense of direction. I usually, already my intuition was lining up with what the North Pole was saying, and my navigation skills were okay. So outdoors I was fine, but indoors it turns out I'm wildly wrong. I have this like kind of intuitive sense of, of an important direction in a building, and the important direction does not line up with North. It never lines up with North, it's always wrong. And so there's this war in my brain between what the North Paw is saying and what my brain is saying, especially in places where I'd been many times, like, like the office I used to work in. I swore the long hallway was facing north, but it turns out the long hallway was facing west. And so my whole view of the, like, the orientation of the building to the landscape was just wrong. And getting over that kind of hump was very difficult. Um, I did not develop the like, mapping sense or homing instinct, like Udo claimed he got. I, I still don't know whether that's wired height and I'm just defective or what, but um, lots of other people have worn it as well, and some of them certainly claim to get increased experiences. Um, and you also get really interesting experiences in places you go. So Adam Scorey, one of the people who worked on it with me, had an experience hiking a childhood trail, a path he'd been down hundreds of times as a kid, hiking it anew with the North Pond as angle. He discovered that the path does not travel at all like he thought. It frequently loops back and covers all kinds of you know, directions that he didn't think it went in. So I thought that was a very interesting experience. Um, another thing that I did not anticipate but was extremely interesting is that the North Pole was sensitive not just to magnetic north fields, but also to other magnetic fields in the environment. So for instance, if you're sitting on public transit, electric public transit, like the subways or the streetcars, if you sit in the right place so that you're near the electric motors, you can feel them when they turn on and off. It makes the anklet actually like go rapidly around in a little circle in your ankle and you get kind of disoriented because your brain has already, you know, associated the, the position of the vibration with north and so it feels like the whole world is rotating around you and you get dizzy just sitting in a seat on public transit. It, it was a very, very interesting experience. <laughs> Highly recommended. So that, <laughs> that kind of brings me to uh, another aspect of the philosophy of these devices. I feel like Technology is finally reaching a stage where we can integrate it with our senses. And the simplest user interface is a user interface that we're already super familiar with. It's the thing that our brain is constructing for us all the time. The world is sending you massive amounts of information, visual information, auditory information, touch information, and so on and so on. And your brain is interpreting that in real time and presenting you with the interface to the world that you have always used, which is your conscious experience. And building devices like North Paw allows you basically to adapt that highly complex system that your brain already has to make a user interface that's as transparent as moving your arm. And there's a lot more things you can do than just North Paw. This is one example. Um, there are gentlemen in the world who have implanted small neodymium magnets in their fingertips that's what that, mark, that uh, darker spot is. With the idea that they're going to increase their sense of touch so that it's also a sense of magnetic fields. And by implanting it in a sensitive area, such as your fingertip, you're able to get an experience of the magnetic fields in the world. So for instance, people who have these implants can feel 
the electricity that passes through the wires and cables going into your microwave, your toaster, your light bulb, your stove, they can tell whether it's on or off. And apparently it's a very, it's like a high speed vibrating kind of a feeling. They can also feel, you know, those security fences you walk through at the airport or at libraries or at some stores. They can feel the, the fields that those are putting out. And you can also feel ferromagnetic objects. Because it's a magnet, it's attracted to iron and other materials like that. And so you can tell the composition of an item. You can tell whether it's made of steel or whether it's made of aluminum. And I really want to do this. I feel like this would be an awesome expansion of um, what my body is capable of. I heard about it originally a long time ago, and I was kind of squeamish because the idea of implanting something in yourself is a little bit extreme. And I've seen photos of the procedures where it's done. <laughs> I, I'm also sparing you those photos. <laughs> but I recently read a project that convinced me that I have to do it. There are people who already have the implant. They've had the implant for several years. And now they're designing devices that fit over the finger and stimulate the magnet in additional ways. So for instance, there's um, people whose name I can't remember, but they've, de they've devised a device that is uh, an echolocation device. It senses the distance of objects in front of it. They attach it to their fingers, and now they have a range-finding device on the front of their finger. And it tells them, you know, by, vib by vibrating their implant, how far objects are away. I think that's incredible. And um, you can think about potential applications in terms of use by blind people or even people who have, you know, vision impairments of one sort or another. I think the potential for that kind of augmentation is tremendous. So, there's already all kinds of augmentations out in the world. We are natural born cyborgs. Our brains are built to do this kind of thing. It's how we use tools in the first place. And I believe that with uh, the coming wave of wearable electronics, that it's possible for us to augment our senses in untold ways. There's numerous possibilities out there. And we just have to go make it happen. So, thank you. <laughs>